Hello everyone. Uh, I hope you've all managed to log in. Many thanks for joining this, the fourth webinar in the series on source to sea My name's Gareth James Lloyd and I work at the UNEP-DHI Partnership, a United Nations Collaboration Centre. And our main focus at the centre is on freshwater and environmental issues. It's my job to be the facilitator of the webinar today and I'm pleased to welcome back my good colleague uh, Maya Batule also of UNEP-DHI, who will be providing uh, technical support. Uh, the Source to Sea webinar series aims to highlight the importance of understanding the cross-disciplinary uh, connections needed to achieve SDG 6 on freshwater and SDG 14 on oceans. And uh, as, as mentioned previously in other webinars, in more direct terms, what we want to do here is to share and discuss with you uh, uh, the value of integrating efforts to reduce the negative effects and uh, maximize the uh, potential benefits. And what we've done in this series is to gather together a number of expert presenters who uh, share their experiences and selected case studies to exemplify uh, what, uh, what we can do and uh, what we shouldn't do probably is, uh, is also uh, an aspect of what we have. The webinar series itself is developed in collaboration with the UN Environment, CWI, and the UNDP Water Governance Facility. And um, collectively, and together with others, we are all part of the action platform for source to sea management. In the previous three webinars, we introduced key concepts as well as the sustainable development goals and their linkages. We also made a start on drilling down into policy and management interactions by looking at land-based sources of marine pollution and uh, how to mitigate the impacts of altered water flows last time around. If you didn't have a chance to catch these earlier webinars, um, you're very welcome to, to take a look at those. I'll give you the links to those uh, recordings in a short while. So uh, on the agenda for today's penultimate uh, webinar in the series, we're very pleased to have another four experts with us. Um, kicking off proceedings, we have Barbara Jackson of uh, Race for the Baltic. Barbara will be talking us through the uh, uh, lessons learned and experiences from the Race for the Baltic program. And in particular, Barbara will be focusing on the uh, economic and environmental benefits in local communities across the Baltic Sea region. Next up, we're pleased to welcome back uh, Christopher Corbin of UN Environment. Chris is going to be talking to us about the uh, details of a project from the Caribbean. And what's special about this project is that it's aimed at financing action on dealing with wastewater. And following on from Chris, we have Mike Young of uh, Global Water Partnership and University of Adelaide in Australia. Mike is going to be encouraging us to rethink our approach to block tariffs for water supply based on uh, what I think is uh, his most recent paper. And Mike will be telling us uh, what we need to do differently and exactly why. Um, and last but by no means at least in terms of the presentations, we have Kinhua Fang of Xiamen University. Kinhua will be introducing us to the ec uh, watershed ecological compensation mechanism of China, which uh, most of you will probably uh, understand as a type of payment for ecosystem services initiative. Um, Following on from the presentations, we have Birgitta Lima, our resident source to sea uh, specialist and a member of the Action Platform for, for Source to Sea. Birgitta will be briefly summarizing her broader source to sea reflections, and this will help us both bring things together and, and round off. Each presentation is going to take 10 minutes, and as usual, we'll allow for, for one or two questions immediately after each presentation. And this is just to pick up on anything uh, immediate and to break things up a little. We'll also be allowing some space for additional questions at the end uh, from you, the participants. I should probably also mention that I, I've warned the presenters beforehand that I'm going to have to be a little bit strict with time as uh, we've got a lot to cover in, in, uh, in this next hour or so. But regarding the questions, 
in the panel on the right of your screen, you should be able to see a box for submitting questions. If you can't see a panel, please press what is probably an orange arrow to expand that panel and uh, take a look down that menu and you should see the, the question box. So please feel free to make good use of that as we go along. I'll be using that to uh, pose the questions to the presenters um, as, uh, as, uh, as they come in. Oh, so, sorry, rather at the end of the presentations and during the questions at the end. And it would be a big help for me if you could identify to whom your question is for and to keep your question as brief and to the point as possible so that we can uh, uh, e more easily cover as much ground as possible. Uh, without further ado, I would like uh, to ask Maya to uh, start up Barbara's audio so she can begin uh, and also to um, uh, get Barbara's presentation up on the screen. Barbara, please, if you could unmute your microphone whenever you're ready. Uh, I'm not sure Wonderful. if you can see. I think. Y yes, just uh, just by brief way of an introduction as to why we're doing it this way. Barbara is uh, a real source to see uh, fan, and she's actually mm -hmm. given up a little bit of time from a holiday in Italy to join with us today. So thanks for doing that, Barbara. Uh, your presentation is visible, so whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you, Gareth and Maya, and it's such a pleasure. I'm, I'm sitting here overlooking Lake Como, and it, it couldn't be a better place to do this presentation. And I'm just very excited to connect with the global community. And um, as Gareth introduced, I represent the foundation called Race for the Baltic, and today's presentation about, is about financing Source to Sea Action. And I hope I can give you an overview of a specific initiative that we've taken that's working to unlock funding for investments that are needed to clean up the Baltic Sea. And um, I'll just go to, I'll have Maya's help today to go forward on the slide since I have a slower internet connection. So we'll move on to the second slide here, Race for the Baltic Foundation. So I just want to give you a couple words of background. Race for the Baltic, it's a leadership platform working for a well-managed Baltic Sea. Uh, we work across businesses, sciences, science, civil society, and governments. And our aim is to identify and implement solutions, but also to look for the scalability. And we are working with the framework and the lens of moving from pollution problem to seeing a regional opportunity for innovation and prosperity. And this is really coming from the concept um, and background of our founder, which is Nicholas Sendstrom. And Nicholas is the co-founder of Skype and has that tech and entrepreneurial background, so very much looking at the opportunity and problem solving. So this is really in the core of what we do. And our work is, uh, it's nonprofit and, and funded by uh, the Zenstrom family, but also companies such as Supercell, the gaming company, um, who, and also Olands Bank and the Swedish Institute and another Swedish government agency. So that's just a little bit about our, our organization, our foundation. We're quite young. We started in 2013. To give you an overview of the Baltic Sea on the third slide here, um, the Baltic Sea region, it's, there's nine countries. So we have Sweden, Finland, Denmark, um, the Baltic States, Russia, Germany, um, about 1,500 municipalities with 90 million people. We focus on a lot on nutrient pollutions currently, but also hazardous substances. Um, but there's also a problem of old sins, so a lot of nutrient pollutions uh, from the mid-1900s. The policy frameworks that are important to know, uh, we follow the EU Water Framework Directive, um, but we also have a governing body for the Baltic Sea region, which is called HELCOM, and they've set an action plan um, that's been signed off by all the governments to clean up the Baltic Sea. And the SDG goals are very prevalent now in conversations, especially with Sweden, taking the initiative at the Global Oceans Conference that was just recently in New York. Um, and just an overview of the investments made over since 2007, there's been about 15 billion euros of government uh, funds invested in wastewater treatment and other water quality improvements. However, at the same time, the European Court of Auditors has said that the EU action to cut the nutrient pollution has only had a limited effect um, the Baltic Sea is still classified as one of the most polluted seas in the world. Um, so we have a severe problem even if we're surrounded by some of the most environmentally friendly countries such as Germany, Sweden, Denmark, and Finland. 
Um, on the next slide, moving forward, Race for the Baltic has joined forces with international management consulting company, Boston Consulting Group, to look at local governments as a key change maker on the ground and to look at the benefits that municipalities can actually capture through investing in the Baltic Sea, um, economic and environmental benefit. And when um, asking Boston Consulting Group to do this, we also did a survey of 250 municipalities. And before I show you the initiatives that we're working on, I'll, I'll highlight some of the key takeaways from that report. Um, but the first is that local governments do, of course, um, play a crucial role. And there's 1,500 municipalities around the Baltic Sea. So that was the first conclusion, that we need to work on the local level. And moving to the next slide, what we tried to do with this report was to look at two different scenarios. So the first scenario, clear water state, is looking at if we do do the right investments uh, to clean up the Baltic Sea following the action plan that HELCOM has created, um, and compare that to if the investments would not be made. So this is really us looking at a way to see the, the, the benefits that could be captured through the investments. So rather than seeing the cleanup that's needed to be done as a cost, but in order to see it as an innovation opportunity and an economic stimulation opportunity. So we're working to change the framework and the lens of looking at the Baltic Sea pollution problem. On the next slide, one of the key conclusions of the report, um, if we could just move, it's, thank you, 270 million in economic upside within an average municipality if making the investments to improve the Baltic Sea. And what we, we took an average municipality here and we saw the, the opportunity which comes from water technology investments, but especially from tourism, um, but also property values. And looking at tourism in the Baltic Sea region, when we experienced algae blooms, we saw a significant decrease in tourism um, that affected especially local governments, hotel stays, et cetera. Um, but also property value. So there's a real economic incentive here. And I think that the point that I want to make here is that um, when we started this work, when we spoke with municipalities, investing in the Baltic Sea was seen as a cost. So this has essentially been a tool to help us change the conversations when we go to the government. On the next slide, um, from the 250 interviews we did with the cities, what we found out uh, was a very big challenge which was that two-thirds of the municipalities in the Baltic Sea region are either unaware of the situation or they lack the resources to address it. And this has been a very interesting conclusion looking when the national government has made their legislations and policy suggestions, um, we can actually see that the local actors feel that they don't have the resources to make the investments that are needed. So that's obviously a, a very um, large challenge that we need to overcome. What this slide also shows, um, at the bottom, 25% of the municipalities were unaware. 45% are unarmed, which means they, they felt that they lacked the resources to make the investment. But even more interesting, we had 30% executors. And these are municipalities that are taking action, but not necessarily using a strategic lens um, and the leaders, which was less than 1%, were those municipalities that really tracked their pollution sources, and then they created a strategic way forward looking at the investments that were needed. So very much using a corporate change business lens. And there are a few municipalities that we saw do that. For instance, Helsinki and Turku municipalities that are located in, in Finland. Um, so what we decided to do with this information was to see how could we work with municipalities to unlock funding, so looking at the benefits and the innovation opportunity. And I'd like to share with you the initiative that we're working on now. It's called the Baltic Sea City Accelerator on the next slide. And this, the Baltic Sea City Accelerator is an 18-month ex acceleration program that we've designed to work with municipalities to essentially meet them at their starting point if it's unaware or unarmed and to help them move up that ladder staircase that you just saw on, on the slide beforehand and to work with them to identify their solution or sorry their sources of pollution and then also to design a strategic plan to move forward. 
And on the next slide, you can see these are the 12 municipalities that we've been working with now in a pilot program um, during the past 18 months. It concluded a couple weeks ago. And at the same time, we're looking to create this collective impact. So looking at what Marie Hamm in one city is doing and how can they share that with another city. On the next slide, um, I'd like to share with you the framework that we're using with the municipalities to show them that there's opportunities to be captured. New sustainable businesses, increased opportunities for recreation and tourism, creating attractive communities, but also other things like flood control and biodiversity, but population well-being. So this is really a material that we could take directly to the mayors. On the next slide, um, this is just a little overview of what we've been doing with the municipalities, working from idea labs, interviews, innovation labs. And that's been done on, with a strategic innovation community. And I wonder, do you have that slide? The next slide, would it be the innovation community? If you have the updated, no, it's not that slide. But I'll just say a few words. Um, we have a, we've built up an innovation community that basically consists of um, banks, such as the European Investment Bank, Nordic Investment Bank, but also research institutions such as CWE, who's uh, a part of this call, SEI, and using the source to see concept. So it's really working with the municipalities to identify the right investments in the right place and then creating a business case. On the next slide, um, this is some of the first results that we have from the pilot program that we've just done with 18, over the 18 months. Um, and our municipalities have now committed to uh, reaching the HELCOM, the governing body's nutrient reduction targets. And they've set clear mission and vision statements for strong blue economies. So using this lens, or they're changing their framework of working with these issues instead of seeing it as a pollution problem to see an opportunity. And here you can just read a little bit about some of the investments um, that we're looking to hopefully implement over the coming years. Um, then, just since this is a short 10-minute presentation, I'm going to move already to the final slide here with some of the, our key learnings. Um, and I hope that this, this is really the start of a conversation, um, an example of one initiative, and I hope to connect with you further to hear what you're doing. But what, what we see is, number one, is identify and, and work with the polluters. It sounds obvious. Um, but often we have a lot of work on the national level and we're not always getting down on the ground and rolling up our sleeves. So we go right to the municipalities and we partner with them. Um, and we partner with the companies that they're working with or the agriculture um, industry. The second is to showcase the benefits and work to build the business case. Um, and that I've mentioned already before, the business case with the municipalities has proven to be an instrumental tool that allowed them to get on actors that weren't normally involved in the issue, um, including schools, um, but also farmers um, and, um, and also technology companies. Um, and then working with the stakeholders in the full value chain. So that means the government banks, like I said, European Investment Bank and Nordic Investment Bank, um, they're there and prepared to support the cities with technical assistance. Um, but they need sometimes an inter intermediary partner, such as a foundation. Um, but we also join with technologists um, such as Ericsson. They're currently doing a sensor project to look at how we can use real-time data as well. And finally, we just need to bust through the myth. myth. Um, there is absolutely, there's funding available. There has to be. Um, and I think keeping that positive out, out attitude and positive framework looking forward, it, takes, take, it will take us a, a long way. And that's important just to keep that mentality and to keep positive throughout the process. Um, so that's the introduction from myself. I look forward to hearing the other presentations and learning from you. Um, please reach out to us. On the final slide, you'll see links. On the Baltic Sea City Accelerator, you'll, see, you'll find a video as well. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Oh, thank you as well, Barbara. But please don't run away just yet. I hope <laughs> you've got uh, time for uh, yeah. a question and maybe... Uh, do you also have time to hang around for the next 45 minutes for yes, the questions I'll be at the here. end? I'll be here. Okay, great. Uh, a very quick question before we move on. Uh, how can countries learn more mm -hmm. about uh, this uh, race for the Baltic, or rather, what lessons do you think mm -hmm. are applicable to other regions? We, mm -hmm. uh, I think it was last time around we had a, a colleague 
or, or the, perhaps a time before from Italy who mm -hmm. was talking about uh, pollution around the coasts of Italy mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, so I mean th there must be a lot of parallels with other regions mm -hmm. and countries. Yeah, so the first thing that comes to mind when you say that is that we need um, I think a, a, a digital platform to communicate and share with on the local government level to show the progress and to reward the ones that are doing good work. Um, there's a lot of great work that's been done but we don't always hear about it. Um, and creating that friendly competition and collective impact overview. Um, and I think just calls like this is just letting us to, to start to connect. And working with someone who developed Skype, I can say our, we always think about the digital platforms and the opportunities from apps or using um, Internet of Things, etc. So I think that there's a lot of opportunities out there for us to connect as we move forward. Great, thanks for that, Barbara. I think uh, speaking as one of the co-organizers of, of this initiative, mm -hmm. I think we, we're sharing a similar experience of one of the challenges is just to begin by sensitizing people to uh, mm -hmm. to the issues. So uh, thank you very much exactly. for that. Thank um, you. Maya, please could I ask you to pass the presentation over to Chris from UN Environment. Yes, Chris, we can see your uh, presentation now. We can't hear you yet. No, thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. And, and let me also say it's, it's certainly a distinct pleasure to be able to share some experiences from the warm Caribbean. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I don't know, we're hearing too much about uh, the, the coast of Italy and the Caribbean today. But uh, please go on whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you very much. And, and what I'll be doing in this short presentation is sharing some experiences from a regionally implemented uh, wastewater project funded by the Global Environmental Facility, but focusing primarily on innovation in financing. I wanted to start by perhaps giving a little bit of context in terms of what was one of the major drivers, not just for the project, but for activities to support wastewater management in the wider Caribbean region. And, and that's the, the Regional Seas Convention for the wider Caribbean, the, the Cartagena Convention, which has three main agreements dealing with oil spills, biodiversity, and pollution. Interestingly, the one on pollution actually developed because of the concern by governments of the need to improve wastewater management and the fact that wastewater was identified as one of the major pollutants affecting human health and tourism. The situation remains challenging. Uh, only about 20% of wastewater generated in our countries is, is treated. A significant amount of wastewater enters the Caribbean Sea, which is essentially the main resource for tourism, for fisheries, uh, for protection of our coastline. And it, it has been identified as, as the number one pollutant impacting on our coastal and marine resources. It is also a very complex pollutant having impacts both on human health, but also on coastal and marine ecosystems. So essentially out of that, the, the, the crew project was, was born. Um, it's now in its closing phases, having started around 2011 to 2012, and had three main areas of focus, one on financing, one on the policy and legislative framework, and one on knowledge management, communication, and outreach. Primarily, it was set up as a financing project, and, and it really involved a unique partnership between UN Environment, which I represent, but also the Inter-American Development Bank, which was focusing on the development of the innovative financing mechanisms. And these were essentially being piloted in four countries, uh, Jamaica, Belize, Guyana and Trinidad and Tobago and all of them were using slightly different ways of financing wastewater management. I would say at the end of the project we we had two that I would say were reasonably successful in, in piloting a new mechanism in Jamaica and Belize, two perhaps not so successful and that's part of what this, this learning project was all about but I dare say in the case of, of Guyana we probably had the major lessons learned, and interestingly, they weren't only about financing. 
there's a start to the project. Therefore, we, we wanted to get a little bit of a picture of what the landscape was for financing in wastewater generally. And we, we did a survey across many of the smaller islands in particular. And interestingly, access to finance was not the major impediment for investments in wastewater. And, and you had other key issues, the, the policy framework, uh, utility, communication to the public, um, advocacy. So again, it, it, it sort of raised some ideas in our mind is that if access to financing is, is not a major challenge, why aren't we seeing more investment in the wastewater sector? And that resulted in a more intensive analysis of what was some of the, what we call a checklist of readiness for receiving funding for investment. And again, the critical importance of, of policy frameworks, um, having the appropriate legislation, laws, and regulations in, in place, just the demand for wastewater treatment by the general public. And, and, and just to, to reemphasize a point made by the previous presenter about how important it is, is really to get out and discuss with with communities, and then the whole attitude towards treatment of wastewater reuse. We were trying to promote the reuse of treated wastewater, but culturally extremely difficult in this region. The traditional uh, performance of, of, of the sector, the performance of the service providers, and then that critical issue of finance or financial mechanisms. And here it was more than just the access to finance, which is often provided by development banks, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Caribbean Development Bank, but the affordability of that financing, uh, the appropriateness of the tariffs that were in place. Many of the utilities had not received any tariff increases for decades. And then how do you sustain uh, the investment costs in terms of operation and maintenance and training. And these were really some of the core issues that came up during the project implementation. As I mentioned, there were two success stories, and I don't have time to go into the detail of them, but I will highlight them. One in Jamaica, um, which essentially had a, a specialized or, or what I call a targeted a tax known as the K factor that's part of all utility bills that are charged um, on water provision. And that particular tax goes into a dedicated fund for wastewater investment. Uh, what they did during this project, which was also innovative, is that they used the funds of the K factor and of the project to help capitalize a loan from a commercial bank to do wastewater improvements throughout the island. So extremely innovative and I would encourage persons, we have a, a video of this um, experience on the project website that could be looked at. And then we had the situation of Belize, which was more of a typical um, cash flow model. Uh, monies were borrowed and then repaid. But again, the ability to pool funds from different sources and to be able to then utilize them for investments in wastewater, we think uh, really innovative and a success story that we can look at moving forward. So in terms of our key lessons, and, and I'm going to sort of spend a little bit just, just going through each of these, because I think that they're really important in terms of the financing for the sector. Uh, we are not there yet as a region, and I think this particular project, as with many of these Jeff projects, is just starting the discussion, and a lot more needs to be done to raise wastewater to the highest policy level. Uh, the critical importance of the environment, the enabling environment, um, and as, as we called it, the policy, the legislation, the regulation, and innovative financing, we really now need to think outside of the traditional financing mechanisms and modalities. Uh, we would like to see, perhaps in a second phase, how do we now get down more to the local community level, perhaps through some form of micro-enterprise financing. For us, the partnerships were unique and probably the first of their kind in this region a partnership between UN Environment and the Inter-American Development Bank. Just our ways of doing business are quite different. So we really appreciated the ability to how do you maybe get a more business-like approach uh, to an environmental issue, which is extremely complex, involves many stakeholders, and, and really does need high-level political commitment. And, and in there, I would dare say the regional agreement, the convention, and the regional protocol were exceedingly good drivers. And as we did the project, also the importance of Sustainable Development Goals 6 and 14 in terms of creating the necessary impetus at country level. So 
what do we need again moving forward? We need improved legislation. We need to improve our utility providers. Um, just as a bit of background, most of the wastewater services in the region are provided through water utilities. So wastewater is not usually considered a number one priority. So it, it often means that there's a need to build capacity uh, to help these utilities develop investment and financing plans and to provide the necessary uh, and affordable finance. Uh, one aspect which I was very happy to hear mentioned in the, in the last presentation, and it's certainly something we can learn from, is again doing this approach where you incorporate business models and business case studies. And here, again, the traditional cost-benefit analysis has really shown that investments in wastewater are a cost to government and not resulting in potential benefits in terms of human health investment and resources. And I think we need to better reflect those costs to help justify why we need investment. So the final slide is just reiterating that point that not just for wastewater, but as, as, a, as a program that's trying to promote investments in pollution prevention generally, we have to better cost um, what are the negative impacts of that pollution to our natural capital, uh, to human health, so that when we prepare these uh, business case studies that are going to ministers of finance, that we are better able to make a case as to why investment in the sector is actually having an, an economic and a social benefit as well. So that has been our experience. We are now hoping for a second phase of the project um, that will even look at broader aspects of, of learning from the first one. And I'd also, I just want to end again by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to, to share this small experience uh, with a global audience. Thank you very much. And thanks to you as well, Chris. Uh, the, the last comment you made actually picks up on one of the questions uh, I have here for you, and that is about the plans for more or similar projects, both uh, inside or outside the Caribbean. Could you just say a few words about uh, where that, uh, where you're up to on, on moving that initiative forwards? Um, certainly. Thanks so much for the question. From outside of the region, there has been a, a lot of interest in the success of the particular financial mechanisms that have been put in place. So, um, and in particular for small island developing states, for example, the Pacific. So we are looking to try and document as much of the experiences as possible to share what worked and what didn't work. Um, in particular, we recognize that for the case of Guyana, where we didn't have as a successful a financial mechanism one of the areas needed focus on was on the legislative and institutional side. So as we look forward to perhaps a new phase, there are three areas that we really need to focus on. We, we do need to recognize that more investment needs to be done in the training to ensure that whatever sustainable mechanism that's put in place actually works. And we also are considering even broadening the scope of the financing mechanisms. These were really at national level, and we want to see now how we can also have financing mechanisms at a more local or community scale. Thanks, Chris. It, it sounds like you know what you want to do with that one. Um, Maya, could I please ask you to uh, pass the presentation over to Mike, Mike Young from GWP, University of Adelaide. And uh, Mike, I'll let you know when we can see your presentation and hear your voice. Hi, this is Mike Young. Um, can you hear me now? If, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we can hear you now you, and uh, we can see your screen. Thanks a lot. F feel free to move into presentation mode and, and make a start whenever you're ready. I just need to um, put this down. Okay, well it lo all looks good from where we're sitting. Okay, great, that's great. Um, I'm going to talk about something which is very fundamental which is how do water um, service utilities um, charge for the services that they provide? And the, the experience around the world has been very much one where um, people tend to charge or use increasing block tariffs. The key messages I want to get across are that, is that increasing block tariffs are harboring, not assisting 
progress towards commonly held um, water and sanitation objectives. And when this is the case, it flows through all the way to the sea. And the second message I want to um, communicate is it would be better for, for all water utilities to charge the full cost of supply, and that includes externalities on all of the treatment programs that they need to, to have to avoid uh, actually polluting the sea. And that where there is a case for providing financial assistance, use separate targeted programs to do this, rather than trying to use a single instrument, the water price, to achieve everything. In essence, the recommendation we're making is it's better to give clear signals to everybody about the economic value of water, to provide financial assistance to those who cannot afford to pay, but don't provide financial assistance to everybody, and ensure that as a result that water utility revenue is sufficient to pay for maintenance, provide full coverage in, as um, populations increase, and finally, importantly for actually this seminar, pay for treatment. If you look around the world, around about half of the systems that are used um, include a fixed charge, and then another half um, have a, an increasing block tariff. A small number, 35%, have a uniform charge, per, which is linked to the volume we use, and a very small percent um, have a charge that goes down as people use more water. Subsidies are also very, very high, very, very high. In Asia, for example, it's been estimated that around 1.6% of regional GDP is actually spent on subsidies for water. In seven countries we've looked at, it's over 5% of GDP. Massive subsidies and still problems all the way to the sea. Increasing block t tariffs, what are we talking about? Simply what happens is the first volume of water that each household uses is either free or at a very small charge. The second second um, tranche is, is, is charged at a sli slightly higher charge and the third at a higher charge and so on. So the charge that a household faces goes up as you um, use more water. And typically, part of the culture around these sorts of schemes is a, a return to the government where the government has to include a significant subsidy as well. So the, the water utilities become dependent upon access to government revenue for what is essentially their core business, supplying water and treating it and keeping it clean. Um, and when you look around the world for what is the real philosophy behind having increasing drop tariffs, which is that wealthy people should be subsidising poorer pe people or poorer households, we can find very, very few examples of where this is really occurring. What we tend to find when we look everywhere around the world is that um, wealthier households are, are subsidised and poor, poorer households are subsidised too. The question we want to ask is whether or not this is an effective way of ensuring that people value water and understand it. When you look at the first objective, full, full actually coverage, which is talked about a lot, full coverage for everybody so, so that everybody has access to a mains water supply and, and, um, and actually sewage treatment. You find the answer to whether or not this works is no, it compromises system and particularly compromises expansion. Affordability, yes, it means that those who have access get subsidised use. When you look at economic efficiency and the capacity of, of utilities to, to actually reveal the full, full value of water to everybody, the answer is no. When you ask can they afford to manage externalities, no, they can't afford to do it. Is this actually sufficient revenue all the time for the utilities? No, it's not there. When you look at the objective of inclusive development, what you find is a high proportion of transfer payments go to wealthy households, not to poor house households. So on a simple scorecard, increasing block tariffs, which are the most common form of water pricing system used in the world, they fail four of the five objectives that are commonly set. 
when you look at the big one, which everybody talks about is R, it's important to use pricing as a way to supply access. When you look at the relationship between household wealth and volume of water used, it's always a scattergram like this, where um, many wealthy households um, benefit significantly and many poor houses, households lose because there is very, very little relationship between um, water pricing and uh, um, household income. And this, this um, applies all around the world. The correlation coefficients are very, very low. And hence we ask, why would you use increasing block towers to do this? It seems to us much better to transition to a regime that's targeted to do this. And the first way to do it is to establish a sound pricing policy. Once you start talking about the principles of having clear signals about externalities and making sure that utilities have to pay for it and where there is a need to, to assist poor households to do that using a separate instrument, progress can be made. The first thing you need to do is establish an independent regula regulator and understand the importance of, of, of sending clear signals to all water users about the cost of what they're doing. And then begin offering means-tested assistance only to poor households. And once you've done that, then you can start moving to a single price for water so that the, so that the value of water is revealed to all and, and actually decoupled from actually uh, um, the provision of, of assistance to households. Then you can um, start charging industrial water users on the same, the same framework and then starting to bring industrial and residential charges back into a uniform framework and then start phasing out the use of the IBTs. And then you can start, and we've found in a few places where we're seeing this happen, that there is improvement in the quality of service provision through time. And once you get that, then you get, get actually the benefits that flow all the way to the sea. And finally, you set the tariff at what it costs to provide all people with all these services. So in essence, in this short presentation, we're trying to put forward two simple recommendations. We understand this is counterintuitive and something very few people understand, but it's important. The first message is it's time at a local level to start looking very carefully at the benefits of shifting responsibility um, from for for actually providing financial assistance away from water utilities and passing it through to to actually government agencies that specialise in doing this, and then encouraging the utilities that currently are responsible for managing water to consider the merits of going out and collecting data on the relationship between household income and water use. And we're sure that they're going to find that, that in fact, with the aim of the subsidised water arrangements and particularly increasing block tariffs, actually is to assist poor people, then it, it might not be working. And to do that, they then need to start, to start a very careful discussion um, about what is the best way to ensure f full coverage, to ensure f a maximally efficient delivery and adequate maintenance and affordability. And if they do that, then people will start concluding that they need to change the way they charge for water so that the benefits of sound water management flow right down from the source all the way to the sea. The problem at the moment, or one of the problems we're identifying is that the, that reliance on increasing block tariffs is, is in, um, at the moment, <laughs> hindering progress. Thank you very much. And many thanks for that. A, a really interesting presentation, uh, Mike. Uh, a little bit um, uh, provocative as well, if I might say. Uh, but of course, as you rightly pointed out, uh, pricing is often seen as a way to uh, control supply and uh, also perhaps control the, or also control the, uh, the essentially the volume that's used and the amount of waste entering uh, water systems uh, after use. Um, a quick question for you. 
and perhaps a little bit of an obvious one, but uh, but a good one. Uh, why aren't people already doing this? If it's, uh, I mean, the way you present it's very, it, it sounds very logical and obvious. So what, what's what's the barrier? I think it's a lack of understanding. Um, when you look around the world, very few people have gone out and looked at the relationship between water prices and actually household income and asked the question, why are we doing this? The short answer is, oh, because it's helping poor people. But if the aim is to help poor people, then help the poor people. Don't help everybody. And as we hear in lots of seminar sessions like this, if you um, subsidise use, you get, get actually mismanagement. If you have mismanagement, you have pollution, and that flows all the way to the sea. Many thanks for that, uh, Mike. So if we want to find out more, we can check out your, uh, your paper there. Uh, Google that and find it, but please hang around for some more questions. To you, the participants, please make use of the, uh, the questions box in, uh, on the right-hand side of the menu there. Uh, please hang around as well, Mike. We'll be coming back to you. Maya, if I could ask you to pass the presentation over to Kinhua. Mike, if you could mute your microphone. Kinhua, if you could uh, open your microphone, and uh, yeah, yeah, that looks good. Yeah. We, you just need to change your display mode. Oh yeah, it's okay. That's perfect, and um, we can hear you fine. So please uh, feel free to start whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much uh, for invitation. Um, I'm Qinghua Fang from uh, Xiamen University of China. I'm going to present a uh, financing approach uh, for uh, source to sea uh, management actions uh, in China. We call the watershed ecological uh, compensation uh, ECC here. Uh, you may have heard a lot about the uh, uh, payment for ecosystem services practice in the world and uh, uh, the ECC uh, actually is kind of uh, PS practice in China and uh, it has been uh, widely uh, implemented in uh, dimensions like uh, protected areas, important uh, ecological function zones, mining activities and the watershed. And uh, in 2014 uh, the ECC uh, system has been legislated uh, in the revised uh, environmental protection law and uh, it is stated that ECC system should be established and uh, strengthened and the local government should guarantee the ECC funding availability and uh, its use in the ECC activities. And further in the uh, 2016 uh, the State Council of China also issued an opinion on strengthening ECC system and, and the amb ambitious goals were set forth uh, in, in this uh, uh, document including uh, to expand the dimension of the ECC system to like uh, forest, grassland, wetland, wilderness, oceans, waters and the cropland and, and the others. And also uh, uh, includes the establishing the, the standards, the, the cross administration, cross watershed, and, and, uh, and also a multiple approach uh, ECC system will be uh, established also. And in, also in this document, the watershed ECC system is highlighted. And uh, uh, one thing I'd like to mention is that uh, uh, the financial arrangement is not uh, it's not the only approach. Uh, it also uh, includes the cooperation mechanism, the industry transfer capacity building, and the, and the joint industrial park sector. And go back to the the history uh, of the uh, the practice of the watershed ECC system in China. It actually started from the local government, particularly the provincial level. Early this century, we look at the uh, table on the right, uh, we see the most of the 
uh, provinces in China actually has regulations on watershed ECC. And uh, there are two typical uh, watershed ECC systems. One is to uh, ensure the water quality of the section cost administration boundary, and the second is the uh, to, to secure the water source uh, pr pr protection. And there are three approaches to determine how much to pay. And, and the first is to look at the uh, water quality in, at the, uh, the, the cost sections uh, between the boundaries. Uh, and the second is to look at how much pollution load uh, from the upstream to the downstream. And the third is uh, look at how much uh, has been, um, uh, been spent uh, from the, the, the upstream governments for the ecosystem service provisioning. And there are many um, uh, practice uh, projects uh, for uh, watershed ECC you have seen. And here is one example in Fujian province is called the Jurong River watershed, uh, which is uh, a very highly uh, intensive uh, 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 human activities, particularly the agricultural areas. And if we look at the relationship between the uh, upstream and the downstream, uh, it's also typical because the, the, the river actually provides more than 80% uh, waters for the downstream city shaman. And at the same time, the river also uh, uh, affect the seawater qualities in the Shaman Sea because the land-based pollution, particularly the, the, the excessive uh, nutrients. For, for now, the eutrophication has become a critical uh, environmental issues in the Shaman Sea. So uh, in 2003, the, uh, the Jurong River Watershed Ecological Compensation uh, Foundation has been uh, built up uh, under the supervision of the Fujian Provincial Department of Environmental Protection. And uh, at that time, uh, the, uh, the, it on, uh, they involved only three cities, the two uh, upstream cities, the Longyan and the Zhangzhou here, and the downstream cities, Xiamen. And the two upstream cities contribute five million to the foundation. And at the same time, the, the downstream city government contributes uh, 30 million to the foundation. And this foundation, this funding only go to, uh, be used for uh, the, the upstream cities for their local projects on the uh, watershed environmental protection, cleanup or ecological restoration. And this foundation, uh, regulation had been uh, updated uh, three years ago and a new regulation about the collection and the allocation has been uh, designed uh, and the, uh, the, the, the funding will be collected based on uh, the economic uh, conditions of the uh, all the counties and the cities in the watershed and uh, and also uh, be, be determined by how much water every city, every county use. And at the same time, the provincial government also uh, uh, partly contribute to the foundation. And this funding will be uh, allocated based on uh, how successful the water environment has been, uh, uh, the, the, the target has been achieved and how the natural ecosystem has been conserved, uh, particularly the forest ecosystem. and. Uh, uh, the water consumption and uh, the location of the city or county in the watershed is also important to allocate the, the funding. And so that uh, uh, if we look at the, uh, the, the experience we learned uh, is the, we, we, see, we really see the benefits of the watershed ECC system because it make it possible for the uh, downstream and the upstream government to sit down uh, to uh, coordinate on uh, the watershed uh, ecosystem conservation uh, and also share uh, responsibility. And then to ensure the water quality improvement and the water source safety. And it really provides the incentive, incentive 
for the watershed ecological conserva conservation, uh, particularly for those uh, upstream areas. Uh, we look at the, the challenges. Uh, we, we, we do have uh, some challenges like uh, we need more science to determine uh, how much to pay. So, so we we need to uh, quantify the investing cost, the opportunity cost, or the consistent services, and uh, and the willingness to pay, and so on. So, so, so we need a, a interdisciplinary and a comprehensive uh, method to evaluate the eternal, uh, externalities, and. Uh, we, it's also important to uh, how how to use it and how how effective it is. So we need a monitoring and evaluation program, and in the whole process, the public participation is important. And beyond the uh, financial transfer, uh, there are still more approaches like market adjustment and uh, some uh, voluntary approaches. So, and, and last but not least is the uh, for so far, the most of the cases it uh, happened uh, in the same province. So we really need a more um, successful example of the cost uh, provincial uh, project. So uh, that's all for my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And thank you as well, Chin Hua. Um, we're going to have some questions for you as well as the other presenters but just before going on to those I would like to ask Maya to open up uh, uh, Bikita's microphone for uh, to, to hear her uh, reflections as our source to see expert and also to ask Maya to pass the presentation over to me. Thank you. So Bikita, if you're there, please give us a sign of life. I'm here. Thanks very much. It's been uh, really interesting listening into all these presentations. I think as often financing is the kind of breaking point for when it comes to addressing source to sea issues. And in the case of source to sea issues, it's uh, even more complex than usual, where many of the upstream stakeholders or municipalities may question why they should invest in measures they, that will only benefit the downstream environment or stakeholders, for example. So I think it's been interesting to listen to all these examples today where of initiatives where we have been able to show, to point to the incentives for making such investments and building more the business case for doing that. Either as pointing to, or to wastewater as a resource uh, or the benefits of environmental improvements for the local economy. Uh, and also uh, the willingness and ability to charge for the cost of waste, waste quality. <clears throat> so, um, all these are important aspects when we build the political commitment to ensuring that investments are made uh, to address source to sea priorities. Because as we learned from uh, Barbara's presentation, Race for the Baltic, funding is available. So. Uh, as long as we can find a way to access it. Uh, the challenging part is finding a way to access it. Many thanks for that, Begida. Um, excellent uh, summary and, uh, and kind of broader conclusions drawing there. If I might ask the, uh, the four presenters to open their microphones, uh, we'll move on to a few questions, I think. Um, and I would like to start with Chin Hua. Yeah. Uh, Chin Hua, uh, yeah. could you tell us briefly what are the main differences between the approach in China and more uh, typical, uh, or, or could I say, uh, payment for eco ecosystem services practices in other parts of the world? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the question. And uh, uh, I think the the main uh, difference is, uh, or the main features of the uh, uh, watershed ECC in China is that uh, government-led. It's a, a government-led program, and, and that make uh, the many uh, strengths uh, of that uh, system, uh, because uh, uh, we have the strong legal basis and uh, and the strong commitment of the local government, and it also guarantee the sufficient uh, funding. 
so then can uh, ins uh, ensure the uh, implementation of the uh, the uh, ecological compensation between uh, the upstream and the downstream. But at the same time, it's also uh, uh, because of the government led, they also have some weakness because uh, it make the process maybe uh, close uh, uh, closer. So uh, it should be uh, more open to the stakeholders, uh, so 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 that the stakeholders can uh, participate, uh, and also. Uh, we we still need uh, more voluntary or market-based approaches to increase the flexibilities. Yes, that's my. Uh, answer. Thank you very much. And in fact, you actually picked up and answered the second question I had here, which were what were the main strengths and weaknesses of, of the Chinese approach compared to others uh, as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, if I may move to uh, Mike, please. Yes, listening. Hi, hi Mike. Um, how do we affect change? Uh, you mentioned, you know, going around and, and we needed to take a closer look at household income and compare that to water use. But there are probably a few steps before that. I mean, there, there's the whole political will business for change. Uh, what, what can we do? That's why the key message to our paper is that you need to collect data on the relationship between water charges and household income and ask particularly whether or not this is an effective way to assist poor households. We find everywhere where this work has been done that the answer is no. And secondly, we keep on coming across utilities that cannot afford to, ex to expand their services, to give the co coverage, to do the treatment that's necessary because governments cannot afford to provide the subsidies. And if you cannot afford the, the subsidies in a very inefficient way, the obvious solution is to go to the efficient delivery of assistance to poor households and not to everybody else. If you subsidise everybody else, then you can't afford to pay for the ecosystem services, you can't afford to pay for the treatment, and then the whole problem cascades down and the people who aren't connected properly to to um, water supply systems and to sewage systems end up polluting the rivers that, and the problems flow all the way once to the sea. So this is very fundamental. The first step is to start collecting the data and getting objective discussion about what's going on because most people believe that subsidising water use makes sense and it's fair to start off with a very, very big subsidy for the first amount of water that people take. Right, right. Uh, um, okay, that's a clear message. So we need to have a closer look at that paper, I think. Um, and just very briefly before moving on to Chris, uh, Mike, are there examples of places that don't use a, a block tariff approach with subsidies in a developing country context? Yes, there are. Uh, there are not a lot in developing countries. There's some in some parts of China, in South America, in um, Santiago. Um, they they were one of the pioneers, in fact, in moving towards a system where everybody was charged the full cost, but poor households, when they were identified as poor, could get a credit, so they would still have access. Um, for water at a subsidised price, but the subsidy would not be given to everybody. And there's a table in our report that, that identifies many more places where this is occurring. Thanks for that, Mike. Uh, moving on to Chris, I hope you're still there with us, Chris. Uh, yes, I am. Hi. Uh, uh, one question for you. Uh, please could you tell us, what were the main reasons for success and failure in the, in the cases that you, you had there and uh, what can we learn from, from those uh, successes and failure just in terms of headlines? Um, definitely in the case of Jamaica and Belize, I would say three main things contributed. One was I think the relationship between the wastewater service provider and the regulator, both the environmental regulator and the utility regulator. So I 
so, so, I, so I think that was key in terms of the leadership of those organizations being able to come together and recognize that the wastewater improvements were necessary, uh, but you also needed to con consider some of the regulatory aspects. Uh, definitely the political um, will, and, and in this case, we, we're not just using it loosely. The, the minister himself uh, of water resources management and of wastewater made a pledge commitment to the project. So I think that was important. And I would say that the, the lesson that, that, that we learned from the ones that weren't so successful is to not undervalue the importance of having the appropriate policy tariff regulation in, in place. Even when we had the money um, to support wastewater investments in the other two countries, they weren't the drivers necessary to get the private sector to come on board in terms of, of, of taking on um, loans and grant funding to be able to make wastewater improvements. So, so there does need to be that environment that stimulates investment in the sector. Thanks for that, Chris. And uh, uh, last but not least, over to you, Barbara. We know we're keeping you from your holiday, and I've, I do have one eye on the clock here. So just one quick no question problem. for you, if that's OK. Uh, I, uh, you mentioned there's funding available. So where is this funding? And uh, <laughs> is, it, is it a case of, as I think Chris uh, pointed out, uh, making the, the business case, the cost benefit, or, or is there more to it than that? Yeah, absolutely. That's been our, our understanding. And when we first set out to do the project, we sat down with European Investment Bank and Nordic Investment Bank. And what they explained to us was that the quality of the project applications was often uh, at, a, at a lower level than, than they would have needed. Um, so I think that this is really a good starting point, too. And that's what we've been trying to team up with the cities together already with the industry partners from the beginning to create quality applications. And the banks are available also to support the municipalities to develop those types of applications as well. Um, but they're not often going out and, and searching for them. Um, so I think what's, what's needed is that kind of public-private partnership already from the beginning at early stages to develop those applications. So that's one source, of course, um, through, through the banks. But then there's also other funding that could be tapped into potentially from companies that are willing to do pilot projects. Um, and that's what we've been working with the Ericsson case I, I gave as one, of the, one example, where they're willing to go and invest, um, as they say, a new market opportunity around sensors and uh, real-time data. Um, so that's through educating um, the companies that aren't normally involved in the issues as well. We can tap into funding that otherwise wouldn't be available. So those are those are two sources um, that we've come across that we could work on even more with local governments. Okay, uh, thanks for that practical advice, Barbara, uh, very much. Mm -hmm. I think we'll allow you to get back to your holiday. <laughs> Thank you. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for in terms of questions right now. Um, as mentioned, this is the fourth webinar in a series of five. The next one is titled uh, Approaches to Assessment, Tracking and Modeling the Source to Sea Interactions. So that's how all about uh, uh, monitoring and, and uh, uh, the various flows and levels of pollution that are, that are going on in this, uh, in this continuum that we're looking at. The timing for that uh, next webinar is going to be August the 15th, our, uh, um, the same time as today. Registration isn't yet open, but please feel free to pencil that one in your calendars already so you can join us. Um, if you have any burning uh, additional questions or issues, please send an email to, uh, to Maya, and she'll either get back to you directly or share them with the presenters for a response. And here, just on the screen in front of you, you can see a link to the recordings and presentations, and that's also the place where you can find the earlier ones. And I think by uh, the end of the week or Monday latest, we should have this uh, latest video up there too, as well as the, uh, the PDF file with all presentations in one. Um, 
in a couple of minutes, uh, once you close down this uh, webinar, you're going to automatically receive a, a survey um, for you to tell us what you think of uh, what we've shown you today. And we'd appreciate if you could use just a couple of minutes to share your thoughts with us. Finally, and as usual, please allow me to conclude today's session by thanking the presenters very much for taking the time to share their knowledge with us and also to Maya for the valuable back office support both uh, uh, before and during and after the uh, webinar. I'd also like to thank you, the participants, for taking the time to join us today and wish you a very good morning, afternoon or evening wherever you are. Thank you. <laughs>